Hello. Let's discuss electrolytes. So an electrolyte is a solute that when dissolved in an aqueous solution allows for conduction of electricity. So a couple points here. First, it must be dissolved in solution. And we're only going to talk about aqueous solutions. So the solvent will always be water. Second, please note it allows for electricity to be conducted from one place to another. It doesn't generate the electricity. It basically allows it to act like a wire to go from one place to the other. If a substance dissolves but doesn't allow for the conduction of electricity, that's called a non-electrolyte. So electrolytes conduct electricity when dissolved. Non-electrolytes do not. From experiments, we know that when we dissolve salt into water, we get conduction electricity. That's why it's so dangerous to, say, have a toaster plugged in next to a bath. Water typically has, tap water typically has a lot of dissolved salts into it. If we're in there, we have sweat. It can allow for the conduction electricity from the power socket to us. Without electricity, it's still fine. We don't have any problems with it. Again, it doesn't generate the electricity. It just allows it to be conducted from one point to the other. If, however, we had sugar like, say, sucrose dissolved in water, experiments have shown that electricity won't be conducted. So the question becomes, why can salt conduct electricity but not sugar? What's happening when they dissolve that makes them different? We can find this out by using something called a conductivity tester. A conductivity tester is a really simple idea. Basically, you have a light bulb that's plugged into the wall, but you've snipped the wires at the bottom. You can then put the light bulb into a beaker. These two ends here are the ends of that wire. If electricity is able to go down one end of the wire through the solution and back up the other end, the light bulb will light up. It basically just shows us, will the solution conduct electricity or not? We found, again, with sugar, the bulb doesn't light up. It's a non-electrolyte. The sugar is dissolved. It looks like a solution, but no conduction is happening. Whereas in sodium chloride or salt, we put it through here and we get a current. We've also noticed that acids as well as salts, conduct electricity as well. So salts and acids are electrolytes, whereas sucrose and sugars are not. To remind you, in order to conduct electricity, electricity, you need to have mobile charges. And when ionic compounds get into water, they disassociate. They are broken up into ions. It's the idea of that ions that's important. Covalent compounds don't break up into ions, but ionic compounds do. So therefore, to be an electrolyte, you need to produce ions. When I have my sucrose solution, it is covalent, and it simply gets pulled apart from its neighbors. Whereas, for sodium chloride, the individual cations and anions are separated, which means they have a charge. This also tells us that if acids are conduct electricity, if acids are electrolytes, they must also be breaking up into ions. More will be discussed about acids and bases at a later unit. But ionic compounds, assuming they dissolve, acids and bases would produce ions. Therefore, those compounds are electrolytes. Polar covalent compounds, on the other hand, don't have a charge, they don't break up into ions, so they will dissolve, but they won't conduct, and they must be non-electrolytes. What about compounds that don't dissolve, like nonpolar or metal? Well, they don't dissolve, even though they may be capable of conducting electricity in a different form, they are not technically electrolytes, so metals can conduct electricity through wires. 
but in a solid state. Because copper doesn't dissolve into water, it is not considered an electrolyte. It is a conductor, but not an electrolyte. But to be clear here, it's the compound that's the electrolyte, not the solution. The compound, the substance that gets dissolved, is considered the electrolyte. So you might have heard that Gatorade is an electrolyte. It's not. It's actually an electrolytic solution. Electrolytic being the adjective. It's a solution that contains an electrolyte. The salt that's in the Gatorade is the electrolyte. Gatorade actually includes also sugars as well, because without sugar it would taste pretty nasty, and the sugar provides a little bit of energy boost. The sugar does not allow for the conductor electricity. It's the salt that's put in there that's the electrolyte. When we sweat, our sweat is salty. The original idea for Gatorade was to, uh, <coughs> for football players and the Florida Gators team, they analyzed the salt that was given off, the sweat they were giving off when they practiced, and they tried to emulate that formula and had the kids drink that to replace the lost uh, salt. So the salt is the electrolyte, the Gatorade is electrolytic. Now, not all electrolytes are the same. There might be differences in solubility, but just because it gets dissolved and breaks into ions doesn't mean it's going to fully break up into ions. So we have a term called the strength of electrolytes. This will be a bigger issue later on when we talk more about acids and bases, but for right now, know that the strength of an electrolyte refers to how much or what percent of the compound breaks up the ions. If something's considered a strong electrolyte, it fully breaks up. It completely breaks up into ions. If it's a weak electrolyte, it may not be 100%. It may not be 1%, but somewhere in between there, it's broken up. So maybe it's 50% of it broke up. Or 75%. Hydrocyanic acid actually has only about two molecules for every million breakup. It's an incredibly small percentage, but it does have some molecules break up, and therefore it is considered a weak electrolyte. If it's a non-electrolyte, it doesn't break up at all. It's zero. So strong is 100%, non-electrolyte is zero, and weak is somewhere in between. So strong electrolytes... <clears throat> could be something like sodium chloride. Every bit of sodium chloride that gets dissolved is broken up into sodium and chloride ions. Hydrofluoric acid, on the other hand, is a weak electrolyte. If I look at the sodium chloride, every single ion here of sodium and chlorine has been separated. With hydrofluoric acid, some of them have been separated, but there are still a few molecules left put together that have been broken up. So it produces some ions, but not all ions, and is considered non a weak electrolyte. Compare that to sucrose. Sucrose remains a large molecule, but is not broken up into ions. So it is dissolved, no ions, it remains a non-electrolyte. But I want to be clear about something. The strength refers to, to what degree it breaks up the ions, it does not tell you how much dissolves. Silver chloride is not very soluble at all in water. Most of it will settle to the bottom of the beaker. However, those few ions that do get dissolved are broken up, and therefore silver chloride is considered strong electrolyte, even though it is very insoluble. So the term Saturated, unsaturated, soluble, insoluble, strong and weak, all describe different things. Strong and weak describes what happens after it dissolves, not whether it can it dissolve. When it dissolves, what happens to it? That's what strong and weak are talking about. All right. I'd like you to look through the different formulas I have over here and try to decide, is it an electrolyte? 
a nanoelectrolyte or neither. So for A, sodium fluoride, B, methane, C, hydrochloric acid, D, glucose, E, copper, and F, carbon dioxide. Try to decide for each is an electrolyte, a non-electrolyte, or neither when dissolved in water. Please pause the video, consider your answers. Sodium fluoride is an ionic compound, so sodium fluoride would be electrolyte. B, methane, actually is nonpolar. It is a tetrahedral shape, so it wouldn't even dissolve in the first place, so it cannot be either an electrolyte or non electrolyte. Remember, they must be dissolved in order to be one of those two. C, hydrochloric acid is an acid. Acids are electrolytes. In fact, hydrochloric acid is the example I commonly use for a strong acid. D, Glucose. Glucose does dissolve in water. It is polar. However, it is covalent and therefore non-electrolytes. It will dissolve, but it won't break up into ions and therefore is a non-electrolyte. E. Copper. Copper is a good conductor of electricity, but it again will not dissolve in water. So although it's a good conductor, it is not an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. And finally, F, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is nonpolar. So again, like B, methane will not dissolve in water and therefore be neither. And I put that wrong. Hold on. Will be neither. Let's say that I have here three beakers filled with solutions connected to a power source. I'd like you to label each of the beakers, A, B, and C, as a non-electrolyte, a strong electrolyte, or a weak electrolyte. So in beaker A here, I have current running through here, and I get a very bright light. With B, current goes through, and I have a very dim light, but I do see light. And in C, current is running through it, but there is no light being given off at all. So in A, it's bright, and B, it's dim, and C, it's not lit at all. Let's assume that all the beakers contain the same concentration. Label them as a non-electrolyte, strong electrolyte, or weak electrolyte. Pause the video and consider your answers. Well, with A, we have a lot of current going through it, which would lead us to indicate probably a lot of ions were there for made, and therefore it's likely to be a strong electrolyte. With B, it is conducting electricity, so it must be an electrolyte, but it's not conducting a lot of electricity, so probably only some of the molecules were broken up to ions. It's probably a weak electrolyte. And finally, C, there's nothing, we don't see anything at the bottom there. It is dissolved, but no electricity is conducted, so therefore it must be a non-electrolyte. 